Hello and welcome to AI4. Our next session will be led by Song Zhang. He is the Assistant Head for Experiential Learning, School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University. Please join me in welcoming Song to the virtual stage. All right, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you for your uh, kind of introduction. Uh, so my, again, my name is Sang Zhang from uh, Purdue University. Uh, and I'm, today I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, work we are working on uh, recently for Holostream uh, for remote robotic control. So uh, this is the uh, print, like outline I'm going to uh, discuss today. First of all, I try to uh, present why uh, do we need the, uh, the true 3D video feeds for remote robotic control. And then I will try to uh, present the high resolution 3D uh, video sensing technology that was developed in my lab uh, uh, many years ago. Um, after that, I will uh, cover the hollow stream technology that enables 3D video uh, streaming at very high resolution, uh, which could be used for robotic control. Then uh, finally, I will try to show some preliminary work we uh, have been uh, doing recently. So first of all, this is a robotic uh, uh, control remotely. It's not uh, something new, like this rest car, you know, RC car. You can, you know, kids can uh, play with that uh, when uh, you, you do remote control to drive that around. However, uh, this uh, control can, uh, can be challenging, especially if the car is far away. Uh, because uh, this, the, all this kind of uh, information we, uh, we get is from our eye, eyeballs, which means we need to tell where the car is all from eyeballs. Uh, so if it's far away, it's, uh, it becomes challenging. So the 2D video feeds from, uh, on this robot makes it much, much easier because this uh, 2D video can see where the robot is, the surroundings, the environment, everything. So this becomes expected for drones. If it's very far away, now you can see where drone is doing, making the remote control much, much easier. So then, uh, the, even for this kind of 2D, uh, it's also challenging because it, uh, you cannot see you know, how far the object is, how far uh, you know, uh, an uh, obstacle is, because you do not know the real uh, uh, 3D information. So the stereoscopic uh, 2D video feed, what I what I'm trying to say here is that instead of using you know, one 2D video feed uh, to the user, now you actually getting 2D, uh, two video feeds, one to the left eye, one to the right eye. So this, by doing that, uh, if these two video feeds um, have uh, properly set it up, then you will be, the, the brain will be able to reconstruct the 3D. So essentially, this will allow user to be easy and more easily control this uh, you know, remote robot. So, uh, however, this 3D reconstruction is based on our brain, uh, which means that there are no precise information, uh, quantitative information you can get from these 2D video feeds. Uh, still, it's, it's be much better than this 2D, uh, single 2D video feeds. Um, uh, it's not the best we can, we can do yet. So, the question is that, um, you know, we definitely need a true 3D. What a true 3D means is that, uh, is, uh, is that you can um, actually, um, you know, precisely do measurement between two points. You can actually do manipulation in 3D space. But why this is, it's not there yet. So that is a question always troubling me. So, uh, this is certainly is not on the sensor side. Um, so as you can see here, I listed some of the sensors um, made by different companies um, you know, on the top. That is uh, independent like 3D sensors like by Microsoft, Intel, Orbec, uh, you know, and all these sensors. And, and, and also a lot of cell phones now have 3D sensor. So the, 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 the problem, you know, the problem definitely is not on the sensor side. What is the really going, you know, if you see the sensing like a market is also very, very big um, uh, from nowadays. Uh, so for the smartphone 3D sensor hardware itself, and in 2020, which is this year, uh, the, the projection 
can be uh, you know uh, multiple billion billion dollars. So what all this shows that the three D sensing is not uh, um, not the bottleneck. Um, now what is really going on, right? So why the three sensors are available, and uh, why can't we use the three D sensor for remote robot control? <clears throat> So now let's take a look at the data. So uh, in real, uh, you know, in real world, right, we do communications. Uh, so essentially, we are streaming data from one end to the other using network. So if you, if you just try to do voice call, right, from one, you know, call one, one person, then you only need about a 13 kilobit per second network to be able to get a high quality voice call. And the 2D FaceTime, you know, video call is, uh, is also very popular nowadays. And uh, for this kind of 2D video calls, high resolution ones, you only need about four megabit per second network. However, if we try to go to 3D uh, without any compression, you need a gigabit network. This is actually is the bottleneck. So in order for us to do uh, the uh, the 3D video, uh, you know, streaming for re remote robot uh, robotic control. Now we need to somehow condense the data such that we can use the current network to stream 3D video without, uh, you know, reinventing this, uh, you know, communication platform. So that is what uh, uh, what we have been working on. So in order for me to kind of explain that, I would like to. Um, Present some kind of work we have we have been working on on high resolution 3D video sensing. So what I'm trying to show you here is that this is a, a kind of a picture, look like a picture. This is a 2D picture, color picture of a boy, right? Um, but if I try to um, you know turn on this video, now you can see I can actually spin this uh, this uh, this data. And then I can also turn it on this 3D. This is high resolution 3D. That's what I'm talking about. So you probably have not seen this often from this commercial 3D sensor, like any of the sensor I listed uh, 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 before. But this high resolution sensor gives us the opportunity actually to know the 3D information precisely from uh, anywhere as long as we put a sensor there. So this high resolution 3D three data can be used for re remote robotic control. So in order for me to explain how we do compression, I have to kind of explain how we do the sensing part. So the, the sensing technology we develop is actually very, uh, you know, basic. So we use a structural technology, which is uh, very similar to like connected, not, you know, in a sense like uh, connect V1, right, use triangulation but we, uh, the, we achieve much, much high, high accuracy and high resolution. So essentially we use a projector. This projector will shine a structure light onto the object surface. Uh, if this, uh, ob the, 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 the image captured by the, uh, by the camera from a different perspective, as long as we are able to find this uh, corresponding point from the projection point and the camera point, then the triangulation can be used to reconstruct 3D. Intuitively, how does that work? So we project the vertical horizontal like stripes on the human face, right? So if you uh, see, this is the one of the images we captured by camera. And, but uh, you can see that the pattern actually deformed by the surface geometry, which is the human face for this example. So one interesting thing you may notice that is the pattern actually deformed, you know, not much at the overhead area, um, because the, you know, here we know that the overhead is pretty, uh, pretty flat. But if you move to the nose, like a tip area, the pattern deforms much, much more dramatically from one point to the other. So this, uh, you know, the, in the real, real world, the real person, the geometry of this uh, nose tip area actually change much quicker. So as you can see here, intuitively, from this uh, pattern deformation, we can somehow get a 3D information. So that is essentially how this triangulation technique work. We use a technique called the phase shifting. Um, so to give you some idea how the phase shifting work, essentially we encode the pattern into sinusoidal, uh, sinusoidal manner. So then we kind of shift this phase from one pattern to the other. As you can see here, this is the first one, second one, and the third one. So we shift the phase 
since for these three, this, uh, any of these images we capture, we'll have I prime, including the background light, I die prime is reflect, including the re reflectivity of the point, and then the face is also unknown. This, we only have three unknowns, therefore we only need three equations to be able to solve for this three, uh, first of all for the face, right? So this is the face information we get. Uh, so as you can see here, the face information also deform in a similar manner as these uh, intensity uh, uh, images. So this uh, certainly from the face, instead of using the intensity, now we can use the face information to recon reconstruct 3D. Uh, so this, uh, you know, of course, this, as you can see here, because we use arctangent function, then this is only get a face from zero uh, to two pi or minus pi to pi. So we have to remove this, uh, these two pi discontinuities to get the continuous face map, uh, then we will be able to reconstruct 3D. I will explain that later. So on top of this, we can average these three images and wash out those sinusoids uh, pattern. We get something called a texture, which is typically like a two photograph of the image. So in other words, from these three images, we are able to re get the face map and then get this color photograph. So the, how can we reconstruct 3D from the face map? So essentially we have to run calibration. So the calibration process uh, is uh, something uh, like we use, uh, you know, very widely for the, uh, for the camera calibration. So essentially we try to model this camera as a pinhole system. Uh, ideally for this pinhole system, uh, it, it works like you from any point in the 3D X, Y, Z like coordinates, you do a transformation to the lens coordinate system then you do projection to 2D plane. So if the system is linear, then you will be able to use the matrix operation to do this projection. So the camera calibration has been there for many, many years. Um, so uh, uh, the, the, you know, the calibration is actually try to estimate these matrices. But uh, for the projected calibration, you know, it's, it's not as straightforward. But uh, if you look at the hardware, it's actually identical. You have a lens, you have a chip, which is, you know, a DMD digital microphone device or uh, LCD, you know, liquid crystal display. So this is also from 3D to 2D, um, you know, uh, transformation. So basically this system from a hardware point of view is identical as the camera. So the only difference is that the camera can capture images, the project, uh, projecting image, which is just the inverse of the camera. So the paper I published in, two, you know, about 14 years ago, uh, is it essentially try to calibrate the projector more or less like a camera. So essentially we try, we, this paper just talk about a methodology that enable the projector capture images like camera so that the calibration process of camera can be used to calibrate a projector. So after this system is calibrated, right, we could, all these matrices are known here. You know, this is alpha, beta, you know, these matrices are known, these matrices are known. So we all have uh, six equations from this, uh, you know, uh, three water corner system to, uh, uh, to the camera pixel from the three water corner system to the project pixel. So these six equations, here we have seven unknowns. We have X, Y, Z, right, unknowns. We have, you know, from, for any camera pixel, we do not know UV for the project pixel. We do not know the SC, SP. So we have seven equations. Now we need another constraint equation, another equation to be able to solve this, uh, uh, solve X, Y, Z coordinate for each point. So how we do that, we essentially use the face. So the face provides the stripes along one stripe as long as we know which stripe is corresponding to from this projected perspective. Now we can add this constraint equation to solve X, Y, Z coordinate per pixel. So by this manner, we will be able to get the X, Y, Z coordinates for each camera pixel, at the same time, we get the texture or color information for that pixel. So this is the just, we convert this uh, face map to 3D, as you can see here. The resolution uh, for this example, the camera resolution only 640 by 480, it's a very low resolution camera, but we get all the details we need. The question is how can we get the high speed? So this was done, um, you know, now maybe 16 years, 16, 15 years ago. So, uh, so we use the, uh, the something called a DLP project, digital light, uh, digital light processing projector. For this projector, it has special projection mechanism. Essentially, you have white light, 
right? The white light focuses on this uh, something called a color wheel. So the color wheel has a color filters, you know, red, green, blue segment. So if this uh, light passes through the filters, you will get a red, green, blue channels. Your red, green, blue, red, green, blue. That, and uh, then this color wheel spins. You have red, blue, green, blue, like, uh, uh, you know, color channel, sequentially, you know, illuminate this is something called a digital micro mirror device. So the digital micro mirror device then reflect light, then, you know, in synchronize with this, uh, uh, the project image, then projecting, uh, you know, create this red, green, blue channel image sequentially project, uh, you know, on the screen. So since this uh, the project refresh this red, green, blue channel very quickly, our eye will only see an integrated colorful image instead of red, green, blue image. Again, this is just like a very old, uh, like a DLP technology. Nowadays, they have LED, uh, uh, best uh, like a DLP uh, technology. You can remove this uh, color wheel by re uh, replacing this uh, white uh, light with red, green, blue uh, light. So in the, the, the working mechanism is still the same. So remember, we only did three questions to be able to reconstruct 3D. So essentially what we did was that we encode this red, green, blue channel with these three phase shifted uh, images. Then from this, the projector will naturally pro, pro, spin this red, green, blue channel sequentially, even though our eye cannot see this, uh, these three images separately, but the camera can. If we synchronize the camera with the projector precisely, we will be able to get uh, this uh, three channel image separately. So by doing that, we captured red, green, blue channel image as three phase shifted image. Now we do all the processing phase shifting, get this 3D, now we can get a, a texture, now we can get all this information we need for high resolution 3D imaging. Since this uh, system uh, projecting at a very high speed, you know, typically the projector can do, uh, you know, 120 hertz, then we can get a real time 3D, um, uh, uh, 3D imaging. So this is what uh, one of the data recording we had um, back in, uh, in 2008, but this technology was developed in 2004. Uh, which is about 16 years ago. So as you can see here, uh, the left side is the uh, real processing, right side is the actual 3D model created on the computer, on a single computer uh, through, you know, of course we have to do optimization on the algorithm and everything. So by the way, this video was created for uh, uh, the rock band U2 in 2008 uh, because they uh, want to use this video as the, uh, the back screen when they perform something called uh, even better than the real thing. So anyway, so this is uh, uh, something we did for 3D uh, sensing. So now coming to the topic that we want to stream this high resolution 3D video to a remote end use the current network. So again, so if we try to stream in this 3D, this quality video uh, using uncompressed data, like OBJ, for example, point cloud, then we need about seven, we need about a seven gigabyte uh, a bit per second network to be able to do that. So we, our idea is that can we somehow compress the data so that we can do that, right? So essentially what we did was that we tried to create a virtual 3D scanner. We know how to do real one. Now we create a virtual one and then we encode this 3D geometry and color texture into a kind of a, a colorful image. Since this is the ideal scenario, everything can be computed, uh, computed uh, com calculated, then you do not need uh, fancy calibration. So this speed can be fast, the noise, uh, you can control noise, you can control everything. Then we can you know, get a colorful 2D RGB, standard RGB image. From this RGB image, we can recover this uh, 3D data and the color texture. As you can see here, this recovered 3D overlay with the original uh, 3D, uh, data, it only has random noise. The quality is really high, but the size is dramatically reduced. We can put this into video, right? So then we, what we get is the video will be from 7.6 gig, uh, gigabit per second to 60 megabit per second uh, with lossless compression. And then if you, you can do lossy compression, right? If you, depending on the quality you need, and we can get it down to, you know, about five megabit per second a uh, uh, network requirement to deliver a 3D video like this, the right mode side. So essentially we try to combine the, the two kind of technology together, real-time 3D sensing and compression technology created something called Holostream. So Holostream is the technology 
uh, that can, uh, you know, uh, do the capturing, compression, delivery, decompression, and uh, then reconstruction from the user end. So, <clears throat> as you can see here, this is an example. We showed, you know, left side you do capturing, right side you can view like the 3D video streamed uh, through uh, like wireless network to mobile devices. So that's what we uh, did uh, um, three years ago. So this was uh, actually very, people are very excited about technology. They thought this could be uh, the future like uh, first time, which is 3D video communication. This is live video you sh uh, showing that how this technology work in my lab. Okay, so this technology is great. So what we try to do is that we try to put this kind of technology to the, uh, to, uh, to the robot to address the needs for real-time 3D, high-resolution 3D video feeds uh, from the, uh, uh, in the field. So as you can see here, what we try to do at least is that we put a 3D sensor on the camera, uh, on, the, on, the, on the robot, then we, we can you know, send this audio, 3D, you know, 2D video feed to, uh, to the computer. So the computer then compresses the data right, Compre compress the data, then from the compressed data, we get it to the server. So the server then can, uh, can, down, can then send this data to our mobile, remote mobile devices. Then you can reconstruct the 3D from these uh, mobile, uh, remote like uh, devices. Then from this reconstruct 3D, you then try to uh, uh, control the robot, send a signal, depending on what you need. So that's what uh, we want to do uh, in, the, in the long term. Then the, um, you know, what we uh, try to work on is that we, of course, we have our sensor, it's a uh, uh, sensor here. We put it on this uh, robot and we use the Raspberry Pi to control robot and, and use the laptop to control this, uh, uh, this sensor and then try to do data compression, then compute, uh, communicate uh, with the server. So this is the like pipeline. Well, our idea is that we try to uh, send this data to the, uh, to the cloud, then the user uh, can download it remotely to the mobile devices, uh, then do all the reconstruction from the mobile devices, then, uh, uh, then control the robot uh, in, uh, in a sense. So this is uh, kind of uh, the uh, preliminary, uh, you know, uh, system we have, which is uh, actually got is working uh, this summer. So as you can see here, this robot has, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, of course it's like a bigger robot, not a very uh, small robot. Uh, so we can put our sensor on it and uh, we can capture that. This software was, uh, you know, I forgot to mention that. Actually, let me try to go back to here. So, uh, this so we have the sensor. We have the sensor here, and we our previous hollow stream system was developed for this uh, you know communication purpose. In other words, all the platform was on this uh, normal PC. So now we try to move all this kind of uh, system based on ROS, which is the uh, robotic operating system. So this is where where we uh, we get uh, from from here. As you can see here, it can can do it reasonably reasonably well. We are trying to, uh, uh, trying to uh, do this, you know, here just very simple like uh, operations. We try to uh, uh, do this on the mobile devices uh, in the in, in near future. So to kind of uh, recap what we have done, um, we think that the, uh, the current high resolution 3D video was not used in remote robotic control because the bandwidth requirement uh, is too high, uh, which exceeds this uh, uh, limit of the Wi-Fi uh, the signal. Uh, like uh, bandwidth. Then we, um, the portable three, high resolution three sensor uh, are available. You know, our, of course, it's high end, but uh, there are a lot of three sensors are available and it can be immediately used for remote robotic control. And uh, so we think, we at least we believe the hollow stream technology could combine this, uh, combine this uh, sensing technology for remote control serving as a bridge or the platform. So with this, I will thank you, uh, thank you everyone to join this meeting. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to uh, ask uh, or you can email me here. This is my contact information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Song. That was a really insightful presentation and we all learned so much. So a big virtual round of applause for you.
All right, if you are looking for your next session, you can go ahead and check out the program page or take some time to connect with your peers with virtual networking. Thank you and we'll see you around.